Welcome to DIY Guitar Making. In the first part of this two-part episode, we cut the binding channels and we cut the end wedge pocket. We installed the end wedge, among other things. If you haven't seen that part first, that's where you want to start. Uh, but we're going to pick up where we left off right now. Now that the glue has dried on our ebony end wedge, I'm going to flip this around in the vise, plane it down, and sand it back to the level of the sides before we can get started with our hand tool work. The reason I flip it around in the vise is simply because I want to push with the hand plane further into the wedge so I don't accidentally break the glue bond, which I really only left in here for about 15 minutes. Now we get into the real meat and potatoes here of our purfling miter work. I'm breaking out the grommel, that's G-R-A-M-I-L, grommel. And this is a special tool, I believe LMI sells it, which you can not only use to cut your entire binding channels and purfling channels, but I like to use it here just to score and remove the remaining material next to and around the end wedge and the back stripe in order to prep those miters. First things first, we are going to remove the excess height of the end wedge. And the way I do that is by breaking off a small piece of the side purfling material that I'm using. And I'm going to rest that on the binding channel and set up my grommel so that the scoring bit rests right on that side purfling strip. Because when all is said and done, the maple purfling is going to meet the other maple purfling at the end wedge and stop there, but the ebony binding strip is going to continue. So that's why we need to set the height of the end wedge to just above that purfling line. And now I just repeatedly score the ebony until all the material above that purfling line is removed. It takes a good bit of scoring because, well, the ebony is quite dense. Next, I'm dry fitting the first binding strip and purfling strip on the soundboard side. This is for the purpose of marking a few things out at that meeting point between the two binding strips and the end wedge. I want to mark where the soundboard purfling meets the center line of the top. I also want to mark where the binding strip meets that center line because both of these are going to form a butt joint with the other adjacent piece of purfling and binding. Now the final thing I need to mark here is where the side purfling meets the end wedge purfling strip. And this is very important because that's where I'm going to cut my miter. At the other end, far less care is taken for accuracy because the end point of the purfling and the binding in this location is going to be completely covered by the fretboard tongue. In fact, I always leave this about a quarter inch off of center. Now I use a small miter box to cut the binding strips. This ensures a nice clean and square cut at both of those locations. My bent purfling strip sandwich can also be cut in the same way here because I will be using that to form a butt joint at the end wedge. The only thing left to cut after the soundboard purfling is the side purfling and that is where I'm going to carefully cut my miter. Here I use an eighth of an inch chisel to trim back the excess side purfling and leave just a little angled bevel at the end of the remaining purfling and of course that is our miter. 
there's no need to get quote unquote the perfect angle here. You could just eyeball what you think will work in this case because the purfling strip is so narrow. If I was doing something uh, quite a bit wider than this, like say trying to cut a miter into the full height of the binding strip, that would be much more difficult. But when you're dealing with very thin elements like this, you can just eyeball that angle. And now I take that same chisel and just nip a corresponding angle into the purfling coming up off of the side of the end wedge. And now before we glue this, we want to just check and make sure that that angle looks good because we can always take another little nip off of there to adjust that angle just slightly if we want to clean it up. And it looks good, so now I'm going to glue the binding and the purfling strip all at once using Tight Bond Original and just running the glue out a little bit at a time and using good strong binding tape, such as the stuff you can find at StuMac. Okay, so the top is all taped up and done, and I'll be able to remove that tape and check that out tomorrow, which will be really cool to see how all that blue turned out. By the way, I like to do the top first for a very important reason, because before I install the binding and the purfling, those ledges that are cut into the soundboard are extremely fragile. We're kind of in the most delicate state that the instrument is in during the whole process when I have those channels cut because the slightest thing can damage those channels irrecoverably. We have those nice crisp edges of the channels, which if you accidentally dig a fingernail into it or you just have it flat on the, the bench and a little piece of scrap wood is sitting right at that edge, it will imprint on that edge and even tear out some wood and, or, or even just kind of round over the crispness of the edge, which will make it so that no matter what you do, gluing that in, you're going to have a little bit of a gap there. So, glad to, always glad to have that sealed up just because the channel edge is now safe. These channels I don't worry about nearly as much because it's a hardwood instead of a softwood. So, I do these second. Otherwise, when I have this face down, I am uh, pretty likely to screw up one of those channels. All right, so we are here on this part of the end wedge now. now. Now, this is the most interesting part because we not only have the end wedge that we want to marry up with the side purfling, but at the same time, we have to marry up the back stripe with the purfling on the perimeter of the back, okay? So this is going to be really the same as what we did on the top side where I'm gonna take this, I can place uh, my little scrap wherever that ended up, my little scrap of this material of the maple. I'm gonna place my scrap on that ledge then I can set my grommel mill up based off of that scrap on the ledge. That will allow me to clear off the excess end wedge on the top here. And then I'm gonna do a similar thing right here. It might be hard to tell on the camera, but you can see I left a little bit of extra wood at the end of this purfling channel. So this purfling ledge here just kind of peters out before it hits the back stripe. And that gives me the opportunity to set the grommel up to match that tiny ledge and then use the grommel to score out that last little bit of material and remove it by hand and then take a chisel and just put a tiny little angle on those two pieces of maple. It's a lot of work for what some might say is a small return, but when you do it right and you can admire those connections, I think it's a pretty big return on your investment there, your investment in time. And you can also see right here, I think I mentioned this earlier, that I did have a little mishap 
when I was routing this pocket for the end wedge and a little chunk of wengi broke off right here at the edge. Normally when I do that routing I always come straight down from the top but in this case I thought I did that here but I must have left a little piece there and so when I was exiting with the router out this way it caught on that edge and just teared off a chunk. Just so you know what I'm going to do to fix that is when I glue all this in, when I glue the strips in, I'm going to make sure that I leave a little dry spot with no glue right where that uh, impression is because I don't want that impression to fill in with tight bond. That is not the proper fill for what we're trying to do. It would look bad if dried glue got in there. So I'm going to leave a little dry area near here, I, also considering that glue squeezes out. So I want to leave a little extra space uh, thinking ahead like that. And then I'm, after everything's installed, that will create a nice little, the binding will create sort of a barrier so that anything that I fill this with, which will just be simply uh, a small piece of wengi to match and some black super glue to fill in around the edges of that small piece of wengi. So that's how I'm gonna do that. But let's get back to what I'm doing here. I think I explained that pretty sufficiently, what I'm going to do, and now you can watch me do it. All right, so both ends are ready to go now. So I can dry fit my binding strip and exactly like I did for the top, I'm going to mark exactly where it meets these elements and trim this down and then trim that little piece of maple purfling down, uh, putting that little miter on it again, exactly like I did for the top. So you probably won't get to see that again here. And then the purfling that's going to go on the back plate and mate up with the back stripe in the middle is just this very thin piece of maple here, strip of maple. And this, quite simply, I'm just going to take to my sanding board, just like that, and just gently put a little angle into it. And that looks pretty good. So the thing about these angles, you might see me doing this and think, well, he's just doing that by eye. For something this thin, you can get away with uh, not having a perfect angle. Uh, it 
when it's all said and done, it gets kind of squished in there and you actually can't tell at all if the angle's off. Whereas if it was a bigger piece, like, you know, these big binding strips are, you would absolutely be able to tell if the two angles didn't join together just right. Um, either way though, before I start with the glue, I'm gonna stick this in there and just see if it looks satisfactory. All right, no sense in showing you the glue up again. So here we are after the glue has cured and I am using my wonderful little 25 millimeter finger plane to take back all that binding and purfling down to the surface of the sides and the surface of the top and back so that we can ultimately sand this thing and see what it looks like. And good morning everyone. So I've sanded this back and as promised, I'm gonna show you that little fill that I needed to do. I've already shaped a small piece of Wangi and you can see it's sitting right there in its place. So I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to glue it back with tight bond. I could use the black super glue, but I know that that would definitely stain the maple right uh, along the border there. And I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna use good old tight bond and that's that. I'll show you this when it's done. Okay, we'll give that a minute. And then I'll trim it back. All right, and here it is, guys. It's looking pretty good. So you can see that is what we were after all along. Um, especially this meeting point here between the end wedge, the back stripe, and the two halves of the binding purfling scheme. That is a particularly attractive looking juncture when you get it right. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.